Hey everyone, I am Kyle Rackey, and today we're talking to Steve Rayson about how he built, uh, he and his team built BuzzSumo with zero dollars in funding. That's what we're talking about today on the Biz Chat. I'm sure most of you have heard of BuzzSumo if you're not already customers. BuzzSumo helps you analyze what content performs the best uh, for any topic or competitor. It's a product that's being used by brands like uh, Expedia, IBM, BuzzFeed, National Geographic, Rolling Stone, and a whole lot more. I personally use the tool regularly when I am researching or writing new posts. It's incredibly helpful, and I'm privileged to have one of the co-founders, Steve Rayson, on the show today. Welcome to the show, Steve. Hi, Kyle. Really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. Um, first, you know, I gave I gave the listeners, the audience, kind of a brief description of what BuzzSumo is, but I really want to hear from you what BuzzSumo is all about. Okay, what BuzzSumo is really, it's almost like a sort of social search engine. It's a bit like Google. We crawl the web, not unlike Google, but we try to find the content that's resonating in terms of social shares and in terms of links. So you can type in a topic like content marketing, and we'll show you the most shared content on content marketing today or last week or the last year, for example. And we take it a step further. So we'll also show you who's sharing that content and who's linking to it. So you put in your competitor's domain, we can see their most shared content, but we can see who's sharing their content, who's helping to amplify that content and who's linking to it. Mm. And we can take it a step further. You, you can look at today's trending content, so you can be the first to share content and things like that. But in essence, it's a, it's a content research tool. Mm. I love it for competitor research. If you, uh, like you said, like if you put in a URL um, and it's say it's it's a blog that you think the audience aligns, you're going after the same audience, you know, and it tells you by uh, you know, ranking and ordering it, like which posts they've written specifically that had the most shares. That's so helpful when you want to figure out what your audience is interested in. Yeah, and I think it's really useful. A lot of people do it. They put multiple domains in, so they'll put three or four competitor domains in just using the or operator, and then you can see the most shared content. Or you can do nice little tricks. You can put in linkedin.com space leadership and see the most shared articles on leadership on linkedin.com, for example. So mm. you can combine topics and domains. That's so awesome. I want to hear kind of the story. Like you started this in 2014 with a couple of co-founders. How did that all come about? How did you guys come together and, and come up with the idea for BuzzSumo? Okay. I mean, a lot of the credit goes to James and Henley, who are the two uh, co-founders of BuzzSumo. The... Um, I'd just sold a company. I bootstrapped and sold a couple of companies. Uh, the last one I built was in e-learning. Um, I was then locked out of working in e-learning for three years, so I was looking for something to do. <laughs> and I came across on the web a very rudimentary version of BuzzSumo, and I thought it was great. I'm thinking, yeah, I prefer this, because when I go to Google, I type in e-learning, and top is always Wikipedia, because it's authoritative. But I want to see what are my colleagues sharing this week? You know, what's the industry sharing this week? So I really liked it. So I approached James and Henley. One was in New York. One was in London. They'd never met um, and said, you know, you, you guys keen to turn this into a business. I'd, I'd happily uh, work with you guys to turn it into a business. I think they thought I was just a mad old man. <laughs> They're both a lot younger than I am. Um, but they'd come up with the idea. So we got together in New York. We chatted it through. Um, and we got together in, I think, December 13, chatted about it. And then we set up BuzzSumo in March 14. And we launched our first paid product in September 14. So it took us another six months to turn it into a paid product. Um, but it was originally Henley and James's idea, so I don't take credit for that. My idea was, let's take this and turn it into a business. <laughs> yeah, you, you had the problem, and you were coming at it from the customer standpoint, which is very important, too. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And I could see that this was a solution to lots of questions that people were asking. And I could see people using it. And also, I found I was using it every day to see, you know, what's the most shared content on this when I'm writing something, what's resonating with my audience, etc. So I was beginning to use it every day. And it's, it's hard to come across products that people want to use a lot. Um, that stickiness is quite hard to find. So, yeah, I was very impressed and, um, yeah, managed to persuade them to say, well, give up your jobs, guys. Let's, let's all go in this together. So uh, the three of us uh, left our jobs and we set up BuzzSumo. So the company was set up in March 14. Uh, you know, it's really interesting how you bootstrapped it. You never raised any money, angel, VC. You came, So you came, uh, you basically came out of an exit. So you had maybe a little bit of money to invest in it at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I put I put some money behind it initially. So I mean, it wasn't a lot, but I I put in I probably it was probably one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, probably. So I did put money in to help get it off the ground. So when it was bootstrapped, it was 
it was more my cash. But James and Henley, the way we did a deal, quite simply, they built a rudimentary version of BuzzSumo. So my view is you guys put in what you've built so far. I'll put in some cash because there are a lot of servers behind BuzzSumo running and crawling. You know, I think we crawl some months, we crawl a billion articles. So there's a lot wow. of um, uh, power going behind that. So, And I think they're keen to get more resources in. So basically we just did the deal and said, you, you put in uh, the brand, you put in what you've done so far, I'll put in some cash, and we'll just split it evenly. I'm a great believer in having businesses that are evenly owned. I think you get problems when somebody owns 80% and somebody owns 20%. So we just split it. So just say, right, let's just um, and work it on that basis, and hopefully that'll work for us. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, the funny thing is a few years before I started Proposify, I actually was working on a social media search and analysis product, uh, nowhere close to as good as BuzzSumo. We called it Social Gopher. And we realized, you know, very early on, we were running a web design agency and uh, trying to bootstrap this on the side. Didn't realize how much money it actually costs to, even at the or in the early days, to run a, a SaaS product that essentially crawls the web and searches articles and pulls them in. You know, you're signing up to, um, I think I read in the article, which was the one, GNIP, that you guys use. Uh, or at least you used it at one time to pull in Twitter data. That stuff is very expensive very quickly. Yeah, it's one of the sources that we use, but it's a reasonably expensive one, as you'll know if you've ever used GNIP. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite expensive. We were very lucky because we'd crawled a lot of data from Twitter and we'd had it stored. So we only needed top-up data. We didn't need to go back and get the full shares for each post. We'd already stored billions <laughs> of articles and their social shares, so we needed to keep the figures updated. Um, but we didn't need to go back the full way, and so that helped us quite a lot. But, yeah, you're always a bit vulnerable so you may have a free API endpoint and then suddenly it's no longer free <laughs> yeah. or it's no longer available. So um, there's always a slight danger in that, which is why we sort of, we've, we've sort of gone a little bit wider in terms of the sources that we use. Um, but you're always slightly vulnerable to other people's API endpoints. Yeah. So you, you told the story of how you got uh, the other two co-founders came on board with you you split the company up you got it off the ground it sounds like you guys worked on just developing the product and getting feedback sort of in those first few months before launching your paid service how did that all come about like how did you guys kind of get from day one to launch an mpv uh, a minimal viable product and getting product market fit where you start scaling Okay, because it was a sort of hobby project of James and Henley's to start with, there was always a slightly free version out there. So we always had, we just called it a free beta. So we always had a beta out there. So actually those first six months or so in 2014 were quite critical. We were getting lots of feedback and testing things from people about what they liked. And I have to say, lots of the really good features on Basuma weren't our idea at all. They were, mainly came from users because users said, I'd really love to be able to do this. So they'd say, you know, I, great to see the share count, Steve. I'd really love to see who shared it. So we're saying, Okay, yeah, we can do that. So we'll add that, that feature in for you. Um, and then I think it was BuzzFeed who said to us, can you show us the trending content? Can you actually show us what's trending in the last five, ten minutes, hour, etc.? So we said, yeah, we can probably do that. So the trending section of BuzzSumo was really built off a of request from them, really. Um, and that's been incredibly popular with, with our publishers. So, but we, so we had a beta version out there. Um, and we improved it and improved it. We got quite a few users on the free product. And then we took that big decision, which is always a really tough one, is, okay, at what point do we make this now paid? <laughs> yeah. So so the end of September 2014, we switched to a paid model. We kept a freemium version. We grandfathered some people in who've been early users. Um, but we switched to that paid model. And that's the scary thing is when you switch to paid is, you know, is there really value? Are people going to pay for it? Mm. And I think... Because we'd done so much beta testing, we were very lucky. I, I think in the first month, 100 people signed up, which is huge for us. So 100 paying customers signed up. So wow. we knew we were onto something. So often getting to that first 100 customers, I think, is the hard point. But we'd really spent a year of working with beta users. People knew us, and they were quite loyal. So when we then moved it to a pay product, we gave them the opportunity of get, getting in at a discounted price, of course. Mm -hmm. But we got over 100 in in that first month. We had long discussions about pricing. Pricing is really an art form and complicated. I talked to lots of pricing consultants, and I talked to friends who said, Steve, I don't think Buzzsumo, I don't think it's that valuable to people. Charge $9 a month. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, this saves lots of time. It depends how you value your time. We we show you stuff you, and also we show you stuff you can get from anywhere else. If you really want to see 
you know, who shared the, the most viral e-learning content yesterday? Really hard to see that other than using Buzzsumo. So, so we plumped for a you know finger in the end ninety nine dollars. <laughs> that's what we went for a ninety nine dollar plan, mm. um, and a lot of advice people saying that's not going to work. But we had a hundred in the first month, <laughs> and then it, we had at least a hundred a month beyond that, um, and now we're running at two hundred plus, uh, no, about two hundred I think at the moment, two hundred new paying customers a month wow. uh, that come through. So, um, so there's a lot of luck and judgment, but. I think our view was ultimately it was better to start slightly higher on price and then we could come down. It's much higher to start charging people, say, $9 and then say, right now it's $59, um, much easier to come down. But I think also it was trying to, we were trying to understand the value to the end users. What was the real value? And I think we were saving them quite a lot of time, particularly across a whole agency or a content team. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's proved to be the case. We now have plans at 99 and 299. And again, people said, oh, the 299 plan's quite high. There is a bit of a jump between 99 and 299, but actually we still got a lot of customers on the 299 plan. So, and again, it's about the value that we deliver. So we have all the extra features like the Facebook analyzer, which a lot of the publishers and people like, that's in the the stepped up plan really. Mm. So so that's how we got there, but it was through a lot of beta testing really off of the, the free version before we decided to charge. That's a really interesting approach. You know, we took actually kind of the opposite approach with Proposify where this, around at the same time, I think 2014 was was when we started really hitting product market fit. We had actually come out a year before that and we had our MVP sort of April 2013, but it took us a good solid year, uh, actually a year and a half probably to hit product market fit. And we charged right out of the gate. My mm-hmm. thinking was just that even when it's a buggy, broken beta product, throw $20 out there and see if anyone will buy it. And then once you start mm-hmm. seeing people subscribe, then you kind of know it's worth something. But we've also been kind of what you talked about, you know, where you start high, you can come down lower. We we started really low and we've been slowly trying to grow it up, which is I think is what most people do. But yeah, it, yeah it's hard when somebody expects a $10 product or that's the, the impression you've given them, it's hard to then say, well, no, it's actually worth $100 a month. Yeah, I think we have a problem with freemium as well in a way. I mean, it's great that we give something back through freemium, but we give a huge amount away. You can do unlimited searches, see most share content in freemium. So we have a lot of our users who don't use the paid product because freemium is quite good. And I've had quite a few people say, you should just close the freemium product now, Steve. You don't really need it. Um, and there is a point, maybe our brand is big enough, we could do that, but we've sort of given a lot away. And the problem with having a freemium version is your anchor price is zero. It's a bit like you go into a restaurant, you know, they put the high bottle of wine there because that's the anchor price you buy something in the middle or whatever but for us the anchor price is zero we're always having to justify what you get for nothing and uh compared to that so i I think freeman does give us some problems on the other hand we get so many blog mentions we get mentioned typically about 30 blogs a day because we track it the buzzing monitoring feature is one of our best features we can monitor when you're mentioned inside an article Mm. um and people don't use that as much so think of us as most shared but actually our monitoring features are fantastic so we have a monitoring alert i can see every time somebody mentions buzz sumo in a post and so yeah about 30 or so blog mentions a day and i don't think we get so many if we didn't have a freemium product now that i haven't proved that but my instinct is People are happy to say, go and use Buzzsumo, go and try it, because there's a freemium version there. Yeah. I think that that helps us. Um, but I think we are getting to that point. You have to think about, okay, do we adjust the pricing now? Do we restrict the freemium? Um, is it really dragging on, on the growth? It, and those are difficult questions, I think. Really difficult. I mean, the freemium uh, discussion and the pricing discussion in general is super hard. We've, we've gone through this. You know, I think you said in the blog post, which is very true, is that pricing is never finished. It's always a work in progress. And it's an art form, like you said. Now, you shared um, a really insightful post. I mean, I have to say for, for people watching or listening to this that um, the BuzzSumo team and you, Steve, publish amazing content on your blog. Um, and it's so great that you're able to use the data, the sort of aggregated data from your product and and create helpful posts. So, for instance, late uh, I think just last week, from this recording, you published a post on uh, what you've, how you've analyzed headlines and what isn't working so yeah. well and what is working really well. Um, you know, how do you guys go about using your, your product to actually inform your own content marketing? Yeah, it really does inform what we do. I mean, I don't think content marketing is not rocket science, but it's hard work is my view. I think we all probably know what works. I think you need to do research to to prove it. Um, 
But, I mean, we know, for example, we see from the data that if you publish good research content, good authoritative content, that gains both shares and links. And that's quite unusual. There are some posts like a viral quiz gains you loads of shares, but nobody ever links to a viral quiz. Right. There are some posts that might get you links, but not necessarily shares. So and there's a sweet spot content. And I think it's it's there are different types of content, strong opinion content gets links and shares but so does research content and that works for us because we have lots of data so we try to publish posts to say okay let's take a lot of our data and we have billions of articles let's take big data sets because often posts are written on opinion so this is a good headline in my opinion and my sort of view is okay that might work might not work but what does the data say i, I really like data um so we've really taken our own advice seeing what works and then we've tried to publish periodic high quality posts so we're not doing lots of posts but we're doing periodic research based posts and fundamentally in content marketing what we can see from our data is you just want to be helpful to people if you can provide helpful content you don't need to mention your product if you provide helpful content people respect you and like you for that and you'll get that love back if you provide good valuable content so content marketing is not hard just consistently provide good high quality valuable content but for us it's research if you take that headlines post it took me, um, well, to be fair, Henley, my colleague, pulled all the data around it, and then I've been doing some of the analysis and writing it up. Um, but that's probably taken us the best part of a month to do that one post. Wow. Um, so it's quite a lot of work in there. And we hope it's helpful to people. But you can see the benefits. And I talk about influencers. We had a f I shared it with a few influencers and got their input, uh, added them to the post. We published it on Monday, and so far it's had, I think, just as we talked today, just over 7,000 shares. Wow. I think we've had almost 60,000 views of the post so far this week. Um, so it's been two days or two and a half days. Um, wow. So we know that sort of content works. Um, and I think people are craving good quality data, good quality research. And I can see if you look at sites like Pew Research on BuzzSumo, you can see they're getting lots of links and lots of um, shares because it's because research tends to be original. It's your content. It's original content. And as long as it's really insightful and helpful, um, then people value that, I think. So you know, it took us a month. We're not saying buy a sumo. We're just saying these are the headlines that work. But it, we give something back to the industry. People know our brand. We get a lot of brand awareness out of it. So my instinct is that's really helpful. But but it does get us links. What What's definitely clear is, is research posts, authoritative posts, long-form posts tend to get more links. Um, and so when we publish a typical post, we might get 100 links. But if we publish a research post, so I did one with, with Moz. We did a research post on is there a correlation between shares and links? And the answer is there isn't really other than a few particular types of content. And you know, that, that one post got 760 links from unique domains. We know how hard it is to get links from people. So if you can get 700 unique links for, for one article, that's great. And I, I feel this headlines piece will do the same. It will get you're already getting dozens of links. It, it'll get a lot of links back. So, and that helps you longer term. It just helps your Google juice, your Google ranking, all those sorts of things, really. Oh, yeah. So, but I think content marketing is not, I said, it's not rocket science, but you've just got to provide consistent, consistent, helpful, valuable, 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 valuable content, content for your audience. We all have, have ways, we all have ways, ways where you might have insights from case studies, from client discussions, from your own data. And so we're lucky we have data, but everybody has some unique things that they can share with their audience, which is valuable. And my view is just give that knowledge away, you know, and we don't gate content. I hate gated content as one of my bugbears. Oh, yeah. You know, I get loads of those pop-up forms saying, would you like this or would you like to stay stupid? So I say, okay, I'll click, you know, I'll stay stupid. The, <laughs> I just don't like, I mean, people say they work and I'm sure maybe they do work, but I hate it. So on our site, we don't gate content. My view is just take our reports, take our data, and if it's valuable, great. And if you then want to sign up to the blog, great we'll sign up to the blog we'll share stuff with you but i really dislike the sort of gated content approach so we've gone you know we're probably not great marketers in that sense because we're not capturing all of that data so you know we've had sixty thousand views or whatever of that post this week but i don't know who they all are um we could have done it as a research report and made you give an email because we probably could have got emails for that um i i don't like that personally and one i never really realized the difference uh, really that how a link is so much more valuable than a share and how h much harder it is to get a link because uh, it's easy to just hit you know share on Facebook or tweet this out but it's 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 hard to get somebody writing an article linking back to you as saying here's the authoritative source like this is where the data is coming from and that's so valuable and I love how you work your product into that content because 
when you're seen as that authoritative source of content, like you, you know, you can Google uh, data from many different sources, but you're actually providing the source of the content that just becomes so incredible. And I guess that is really how you've gotten people like uh, Neil Patel, Larry uh, Kim, Rand Fishkin, all these really big names in the digital marketing, content marketing space that are referencing you. And, and how important were those influencers early on in getting the name out there and t- telling people you know, what BuzzSumo is? Yeah, I think it was really important to get advocates, really. I'm a great believer in getting influencer advocates rather than sort of influencer marketing sometimes is just trying to get someone to tweet or retweet or something like that. And I don't think that's that valuable. I think tweets are small, sort of that small lifetime value, really. They go very quickly. Um, but I think what's really important is building relationships. I think mean, that's really what matters. Um, and through that, building advocates for your product. Because an advocate, so um, Rand is, is just great and just been so good to us. Um, he liked the product in the early days. We shared stuff with him. We did research with him. So I think when you're working with an influencer, you, your starting point always has to be, what can you do for them? You know, that's your starting point. Not what can they do for you, but what can you do for them? And so, and we all have something we can probably help them with. I mean, of course, we can share their content, we can comment, we can do those sorts of things to help them. Um, but what do you have? In our case, we had a lot of data. So we would talk to Ryan and say, can we do any research to help you? Uh, we can also give you access to our data and our tools, etc. But I think you've got to start from that position of how can you help them? And then once you do that, over a period of time, you build a relationship. And I, I really like to meet people personally. So I would go to conferences, not really to go to all the sessions, but so that I could meet someone like a Rand or a Leon after they're speaking and just say, hi, it's Steve from Buzzsumo. Just you can put a name to a face, maybe mm-hmm. have a beer in the bar later. So I believe in personal connections, sort of in-face connections. And then you can build on that relationship later. And so we, we literally built relationships with 10 or so I suppose you would call them influencers, um, and they've helped us considerably, really. But they've helped us because they're advocates, not by retweeting. So Rand helps us enormously because he might go on a stage and say, I've been doing this, and look, this is Buzzsumo, and it's a really cool tool. Um, That's you know, that's really powerful and generous of him to do um, as opposed to just retweeting something, which I think has limited value, if you like. I mean, Rand was have hundreds of thousands of supporters, but I don't know, and retweet might get an average of 20 retweets or something like that. So it's it's not as valuable as, as really having a proper advocate. And to me, that's about building relationships. And I'm sure that the headlines post that really sort of went viral this week, I suppose, in terms of the, for us, the scale of the post, um, it's partly, you know, I talked to five people last week and shared it with them. So Andy, Christina at Orbit, Anne Handley, and said, what do you make of these sort of findings? What do you think? And I included them in the post. And they all helped promote the post on Monday. And so suddenly having five or six you know, quite large influencers share the post on Monday along with our own influence helped push that along really so suddenly we had a quite a big audience larry kim pushed it out on monday you know he's got a really big audience of, of mm. followers for example so um so that combination i think helped us a lot really and it gives us credibility as well um i'm not sure it always helps in conversions but it helps in terms of the brand building building awareness um may help people trust you more as well i think um Ultimately, you still have to do, ultimately, it's down to your product. I think it still comes back to, I would invest my money in my product, not my marketing or my influencer uh, marketing. Not that we've ever paid an influencer for anything, but I would invest uh, more time in getting the product right. I think product fit is absolutely key because if it was a terrible product, it doesn't matter really people aren't going to recommend it or they're not going to stick around they're going to churn even if you persuade them to sign up so product fit is absolutely everything i think so that's we try to do all the time is just improve what we do and we do things which people may not notice we've been in trying to improve the algorithm the, the way we return results in buzzsumo most people wouldn't see that even though a lot of money goes into okay we now need to categorize content so you type in e-learning to buzzsumo and you'll see that we produce articles that don't have e-learning in the title or even in the article but because we've categorized them as about being e-learning that takes a lot of time and effort and things to do um just showing e-learning in the title is easy and we can do that just put, put e-learning in quotes and we'll show you if it's in the title if you just want to do a headline analysis um but we do all those sorts of things to just keep improving the quality of the product for people so, but it's all about that product fit really so and we don't want to extend it too far. I think that's the danger with SaaS products is suddenly it's easy to say, oh, we'll add all these whistles and bells. We'll throw all these extra things in. Maybe that will help. Maybe that won't really. It, it seems to me 
just focus on the one thing you're good at and be better at it than anybody else really so you know if you want the really best results on the most shared content etc we would hope you would use our tool because we think we do give you the best results on that so if you're really looking for top headlines etc we will throw those out to you so we have to stick to stick to what we're good at i think Mm, i love that product philosophy it's one that i share as well uh you know, we were told by, you know, some people in the early days when we were really struggling to hit product market fit, they were like, you know, you should really use that investment money and just build a sales team, sales and marketing team, and just really get it out there. Not enough people know about it. And it's like, yeah, but we can get people to the page and sign up. We just can't keep them. They don't stay. Yeah. So we just doubled down and kept working on the product and making it better until finally people were coming in organically. And it's like, okay, now we can, you know, as you're a scale, uh, you know, a scale up as, you know, uh, I think what HubSpot calls it, then you can start investing a bit of time and money and in, into, into marketing to amplify um, but you know, it sounds like that's exactly what you guys did. Like focus a hundred percent on building a great product that solves the problem. And then you can look at, uh, how do you scale and how do you get this out to more people? Yeah. I think in the early days, my personal view is you stick all your money in the product because it's yeah. the product that's going to win out in the end, really. You know, you can have the best marketing in the world, but if the product doesn't stack, as I say, I don't think that's going to help you. So in the early days, all of our money really just goes on the product and product development. Yeah. I was the only person really doing any marketing and building any influencer relationships. Um, now that we're a bit bigger, we now are employing some sales staff, and we'll see how that goes. So we're investing more in marketing and sales. Um, we're not quite sure what to do because we haven't been doing it for such a long time. So we're like, yeah. okay, where, where, do we, where do we spend that money? But for us, it was getting that product fit first. And we're still not 100% there. We're still, the churn is always higher than you'd like. Yeah. So it's how do, we, how do we restrict the churn and um, how do we try and make it more useful for people, more sticky for people? Um, and I think it's hard for us because we're a research tool. So some people come in and do a research project for a few months. Then they go away again. Then they come back again. Yeah. Um, content teams and agencies, it's slightly different. But um, so, yeah, the, but the product, I think, is, is everything and staying on top of things, really. So we're always trying to add new things. So it's only recently we added links, for example, where we showed shares. Now we show links as well as shares. And I think that's really important addition to what we have. You know, we just did blog post content. Now we do Facebook posts. So you can mm. see what's the most interactive with post on Facebook, if it's, as long as it's a public post. Um, so about Sydney Opera House or a fire or whatever happens is we we can show you that sort of thing so we've we've added some new things that people want but each time we're testing out we've added some things that you know, people didn't like so much so we just try and drop them back it's always hard to drop things but if you don't you get a huge um sort of technical debt and technical legacy of, of trying to maintain things which if people aren't using it there are a couple of features I liked, but the users didn't really like. So we've taken them out of the product, even though I would quite like, like them. Yeah. Um, That's so always hard, isn't it? I think it's really, really hard. Um, so, but I think keeping it simple, keeping it focused is, is quite critical, really. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're a small bootstrap company that's where you have to focus i think yeah and if it's good people recommend it to other people and influencers recommend it mm -hmm. yeah and, and when you can't afford to have a, a whole product and dev team just for one feature like a lot of um yeah. larger companies do it's like you've got one dev team one product team <laughs> where are they spending their time yeah yeah no that's exactly good yeah we don't have those people ring and say can i speak to the marketing department and i say I think that's me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, let's talk. Now, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is kind of where you're at now, because the thing that really inspired me to reach out to you was I read your post uh, that was called Proud to be a Donkey and not a Unicorn. Yeah. And I love that post. It, you know, it was kind of like, are, are you doing more of these like kind of every year writing a post that sort of looks back at the last year, sort of here, here we are where we're at? Yeah, we've done two. We've done two, both 16 months apart, so they're not quite a year because you know, we're quite busy, never quite get around to it. So they're, both of them reflect on the last 16 months, so they cover, you know, 32 months, really. Um, but, yeah, I thought we would just share. I've, I've been very impressed with what uh, Rand has done at Moz with transparency, what Buffer have done. And I wouldn't be as transparent as Buffer. I think there are dangers in being so transparent yeah. uh, around things. So I wouldn't Salaries and whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I wouldn't go that far, but I think I'm quite happy to share our lessons because we're not funded and those sorts of things. Um, we can share a lot more. We can be a lot more open, really. And it's really about being part of the community and learning. I learn from other people all the time, and I'm keen to give back things that we've learned, really. And so I try to be reasonably open as we can be, um, but we won't get a version of that. 
policy, which um, I think few companies would follow. And then the danger of that is when like they did need to make this intro, that it can be quite hard some of that transparency because there are some things you can't be super transparent about. Um, so so I don't think that transparent. But we do try to share. Uh, our lesson really and it did come from those companies being quite um, transparent but I really wrote the post just because I, I've been thinking about it for a while and um, Ryan has been writing a new book which can, will come out so I think later in the year um, one of the titles he was asking on Twitter about titles and one of the titles he discarded was Blinded by Unicorns and I thought yeah that, that's right people are blinded by these unicorns because um, they are incredibly rare creatures but if you read articles on SAS most of them are about super hyper growth, how to grow super fast, how to be a unicorn. Um, and I don't think that's where most of us are. I think there are some people like that, but that isn't where most of us are. And it's almost like you've got to be a unicorn because if you're not a unicorn, you're just a donkey and no one wants to invest in you. And um, and so I was deliberately being a bit provocative saying, well, we're actually proud to be a donkey because, you know, we're profitable, we're growing, uh, those sorts of things. And you can make good money out of running SaaS uh, companies of our sort of size and scale and profitability. Um, and I, I just think there are dangers. I mean, I've seen friends of mine get really stressed and ill going down that unicorn route because it, by its nature, I mean, you know, VCs will tell you if they're honest, that they'll invest in 100 companies because they know only five or six may really make it and the rest may not make it. Mm. And they spread their risk. But if you're the owner of that business or you're the CEO, you're all in, you're all committed into that. And so the VC may say, OK, no, let's just shut it down now. Let's try something else. But you put your life and soul into that. And that's incredibly stressful. And if you're in a bootstrap business, you try to get to profitability very quickly. You keep your costs down. You try to get to at least break even quite quickly, which we were fortunate to do at BuzzSumo. But um, and so we got to, to profitability quite quickly. But but if you're in a unicorn, you don't do that. You try for hyper growth. So you're investing lots in sales and marketing and brand building. So almost by definition, you're cash negative. You're burning cash. So that's quite a stressful position because you're, you're burning cash. That means you only have a limited runway. At some point, you run out of cash and then you need another funding round or you need something else. Um, so it's particularly stressful position i'm not saying it's not stressful to be bootstrapped because it's your cash <laughs> everything's on the line for you you're taking the risk but you can manage those risks in a different way you can say look we'll keep the cost quite low we'll minimize our exposure whereas when you're on the unicorn route you know you've really you've got to you know, you're either on the unicorn route or you're not and then you're all in you've got to invest lots of money sales and marketing brand building and you know for 90 plus percent of people that's not going to work um yeah. it might be you can sell out at a different level but um but most of them it's not it's just going to fail really and that's okay for a vc because you spread your risk but yeah. for the individuals involved in companies it's an incredibly stressful place to be i think and you have less control so in bootstrap you have different type of risk but you have at least the control of what to do uh, in a vc business you you're Fair enough, you give up some control because you're taking money in exchange. So they're just different routes, really. And I just felt that the balance of most of the articles are all about the excitement of being a billionaire and being a, you know, a unicorn, etc. Um, and I think for most of us, that's not necessarily where we are. But you can still make millions of, of pounds or dollars um, through you know smaller SaaS companies that are profitable, etc. You, you don't need to try and to be that sort of uh, unicorn. And some will succeed. I mean, HubSpot's there, and um, you know others are going down that route. But um, you know, and we're not going for that. I mean, we're clearly not uh, going for that sort of approach. I mean, people do say, oh, Steve, but if you grew, you could become an all-encompassing tool. You could build a buffer-type sharing engine alongside what you do. And I'm thinking, yeah, we're really not that. You know, Buffer do that very well or who suite. So uh, we don't want to build a sharing tool out on top of um, BuzzSumo, et cetera. Um, but it is possible. I mean, you know, and you have spot many years ago where they were almost more, more, more or less a landing pages tool, et cetera, and mm -hmm. that's grown and grown. So they, they have a whole web system and a whole CRM and become a full suite. So, um, But it's a different type of approach, really. And, and it's it, it's not necessarily the approach for everyone, I think. So that's, I was just really trying to take a little bit of a dig at, you know, it's okay not to want to be a unicorn because there's always this assumption that we all have to be unicorns, really. So I was, I was kicking back a little bit. And I think people like, like, Facebook, like a donkey would as well. Yeah, like a donkey would definitely kick back. <laughs> I think other people have done it probably better than we have in terms Basecamp have made some similar points, etc. But um, um, yes, yeah, so it was partly a reaction, but it was probably when I saw, uh, ran titles and it got discarded but it was blinded by unicorns i think yeah well, some people are blinded 
And speaking of Rand, I mean, Rand has been very transparent about how the difficult time that Moz has been having as a business. I think they're around 60 million uh, ARR, somewhere around there. And they've had a lot of struggles, um, you know, just being able to grow and be able to stay, uh, to even get profitable. They've split their product into multiple different types of products. I think they're a prime example. Uh, and, and, you know, I should say they're a great company and, and I, uh, I'm sure everybody knows Rand Fishkin is a very smart, awesome dude, but they've had a lot of struggles in their business. And I think a lot of it has come from trying to scale too quickly. Would you agree? I'm the ins and outs of Moz, so I can't give any authority on what they do. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I think it's amazing that Rand is as transparent as he is and, and very open and just a genuine guy. I think, um, but I think you do get difficulties in that. I mean, what's disappointing in a way is you do you say 60 million ARR, but you don't think you're successful because you're not going to profitability. I mean, if I've built a 60 million ARR business, that's really successful. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the other danger of this thing as well is because you're not a billionaire, that's not success. Um, I talked to somebody recently, they built a company and they think they were doing 25, 30 million dollars. And they said, but when we need to build it faster. And I think, you know, that's you've they're incredibly successful to build that. I mean, but, but it's not. It's not when you've got 500 or 1,000 engineers, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's true. I mean, and that's the issue. If you're, go, if you're going for that big unicorn, then you have to drive that growth. Um, and that's hard. And also, if you've taken a lot of investor money, you have to grow out of the growth because they're going to want their returns on the money back. So um, it, it creates a different type of pressure, really. Um, and I think, as you say, that is why it is. I'm sure if Moz wasn't funded in the way it's funded, I'm sure they could get it down to profitability. At, at 60 million revenues, you could do that. Um, so, yeah, I just I can't comment because I don't know the ins and outs of, of their business. I wouldn't like to really comment. But I think I know other friends of mine who've had difficulties in, in just the sheer growth that they needed to achieve. The targets they've been set are really stretched targets. And that's created huge pressures on them personally. Um, when I think these are super smart guys, they could have built a five million, ten million dollar business, which is probably doing two, three, four million a profit a year, so they can build that sort of business, um, and that'd be really successful. Instead, they've gone this route, and um, it has created enormous personal stresses. And I suppose that's distressed me a little bit in terms of seeing some people go down that route and just the sheer stresses that come from that as well on their families, friends, etc. And so I just, yeah, so my article is a bit of a kickback. So there are other routes. Yes, you won't be as wealthy, but how much do you need if you make X millions, et cetera? You know, it's um, it, it's about balance. Life is all about balance, really. So, um, yeah, so I, it, that's what the article is about. It's just there are other ways to be successful. My view is, you know, we build a little $5 million turnover business. We're still growing. Hopefully we'll do 30%, 40% this year. Um, so to me, that's a success. It's so yeah. we build a brand, we're doing some nice things, we're employing some people, we're giving them high quality jobs. The other thing is we're giving them job security. The other thing that you have to accept if you're going to be a unicorn, you have to throw a lot of money in it. You employ a lot of engineers, you employ a lot of marketing staff. And at some point, the VC say, may say, we need to get this to profitability. That basically means you cut staff. Yeah. And the reality is you cut back staff. So you know so that job security is not necessarily you have to be quite tough because the nature of your model means at some point they may say well, well let's get to profitability now let's lose half those engineers mm -hmm. uh let's you know lose half those sales staff um so there's another form of stress in terms of the nature of the organization and that's why i say it's, it's okay to be transparent until suddenly it's like well okay we need to cut this thing back we need to get to profitability um so it's different whereas we're growing slowly we're employing people we're giving them jobs as long as they can do the jobs well etc we hope to provide job security and those sorts of things so it's a different type of approach really i think and then i was just trying to say that i, I think that's still still valuable and, and still successful yeah and, and it sounds like you guys are really you know you're you're, you're growing in a smart sustainable way and and hopefully having fun doing it because i think that's super important too right yeah, no, it's, it's incredibly important. It's important to do things that you want to do. So sometimes we do things which actually, if we were under a VC company, we'd never do. And maybe that's a bad thing. So, you know, we built this little tool called Bloomberry. We thought, wouldn't it be fun to just get a database of all the questions anyone's ever asked about a topic? Mm -hmm. So type it in and see all the questions drawn from all the forums across the, the web. And so we built a tool called Bloomberry. Um, and we're now going to, it's actually still there, it's free and people can use it, but we're going to fold it into BuzzSumo as a question analyzer because mm -hmm. a lot of the best content is answering questions. If you know what questions your customers are asking, the best content is is, is answering those questions. So um, so what Bloomberry does and what the question analyzer will do in BuzzSumo when we get it in there in September is you can just type in a topic and we'll 
show you all the questions people are asking and all on the different forums and it helps you come up with content ideas and answer those questions um strictly speaking do we need to do that it was an interesting technical challenge <laughs> to do that it was interesting to build out a slightly separate tool um at, at vc we probably say just don't, don't, bother, don't even go there steve <laughs> do something else but for us it was interesting and fun to do we shouldn't have done it i think as a separate brand and so we haven't done that now we're folding it back into buzz sumo and i, I think you can dilute brands too quickly really so there is a danger of that so but sometimes we can take on little projects even the research projects we're doing, maybe VC wouldn't be so happy we spend a month doing a research project. <laughs> I think it's useful, it's valuable, it gives people data, it helps build our brand. Um, but ultimately, we're in control, so we can take the decisions on that, really. And I think um, you have less scope to do that in reality in a, in a VC-backed business because your focus is just on growth, 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 you know, and then, you know, whatever your, your final outcome is, whether you're going to float it or whether you're going to sell it or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So, yeah, you definitely have a lot more control. Well, congratulations on uh, and, and and great job on building an amazing product. I'm I'm becoming like I've used it a bit before, but I'm actually really excited to like dig into it even more and uh, take a look at some of those really cool features that you talked about. Um, and thank you for being on the show. Is there anywhere that you want to send people who are watching this or listening to it? Um, if people just want to go to buzzsumo.com, I mean, I say we've got a freemium tool. The homepage has a search box like Google. Just type in any topic or a competitor domain. And then you see how it works. I'm a great believer in don't tell people about your product. Just show them. Right? It's a show, not tell, really. So, yeah. um, um, and so the best thing that's worked for us, I think it's something like 78% of people who land on our homepage type something into the search box. Um, and then they see how the tool works. So you had to say go to buzzsumo.com, typing any topic you're interested in, and then you'll see what Buzzsumo does. Um, and play, try, try a domain, try a topic, try a topic and a domain, uh, and just have a play. That's awesome. And there will be links to not only BuzzSumo, but some of the articles that we talked about uh, on the show. They'll be in the show notes uh, on our site, proposify.biz slash podcast. Steve, it's been a pleasure having you on the, on the show, and thank you for uh, taking the time to be here. No, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.